This is my Mac Pro 2008, aka the 3 comma 1. It's my favorite computer I've ever owned as the Mac Pros are absurdly over-engineered. Hence how I was able to use this for a decade as my primary computer. I want to give this one hell of an upgrade by adding two USB-C ports, 10 gigabit ethernet, and dual PCIe NVMe SSDs. And we'll come back to that in a second. I've upgraded nearly everything you can on this computer except for I've never tried to use NVMe SSDs. The Mac Pro 2000 2008 does not officially support PCIe SSDs, but it can boot off SATA SSDs, be it 2.5 inch SATA drives or in the M2 format, but not MVME. Thanks to some people that are much smarter than me, there are a couple ways of getting this working, which I'll get to. But wouldn't it be really nice if there's just a single PCIe card that could just do everything non-graphics related, you know, SSDs, USB-C, 10 gigabit ethernet? Well, it turns out someone thought of that. It's like Sonnet read my mind, or at least my Amazon.com wishlist. Special thanks to Sonnet as they sent me a Mac Fiverr card. It's a beast of a PCIe card that supports not one, but two NVMe drives, two USB-C ports, and 10 gigabit ethernet. Get it? Mac Fiverr, five ports in one, MacGyver together. It's a dated reference and a bit of a dad pun, but I think they know their audience. Booting off NVMe is not the only issue here. Apple removed the drivers for the 10 gigabit ethernet chipset in this card so it no longer works under modern Mac OS. But with open core, I should be able to make this work as well. All right, I'm almost done editing this video and I realize it just gets really geeky. So buckle up, but I swear if you stick around, you'll learn something or you can just skip to the review part at the end. First things first, I need to remove this card from my Mac Pro 2019 where this card's lived since Sonnet sent it to me months ago, and I have zero complaints about it. They haven't even bugged me about a timeline for this video, and I want to be very clear, every word in this video is my own, and they didn't pay me a cent. Moving on, I bought a cheap NVMe 512GB SSD, and I placed it in the empty slot on this card, and decided to leave in my other SSD, as it has Windows 10 on it. Normally, I don't spend a lot of time installing PCIe cards in my videos, but I discovered an issue. My particular 580 is a thick boy. There are slimmer versions of this card, but it makes it tough for me to install a PCIe card next to it. If you're not familiar with the Mac Pros, you're probably wondering why I'm so insistent on using the port above the GPU, and that's because the bottom two slots are 16x, and the top two slots are 4x. If I want to get the best performance out of this card, it certainly needs to be on the 16x slot, as a single NVMe drive can completely saturate a 4x slot, and especially on a computer that uses PCI 2.0. <laughs> I tried my absolute damnedest to get this to work, until I realized I didn't need my other two PCIe cards. So I moved my RX 580 to the second slot and place my Mac Fiber into the first slot. I'll keep the spec short for my regular viewers if I have such a thing. This Mac is running Mac OS 12 Monterey as I had issues trying to get Sonoma to work with OpenCore Legacy Patcher. It has a 4GB RX 580, two SATA SSDs, 8GB of RAM, and this computer has been the star of several videos which will be linked in the description, as well as all the links discussed in this video, as well as the written guide. To start off, I booted with the two NVMe SSDs, plugged in my USB-C drives and gigabit ethernet. This turned out to be a mistake, as it caused a lot of weird behavior. My system preferences weren't loading, I couldn't update OpenCore as it launched, then crash, and it eventually froze. I rebooted without Ethernet and USB-C plugged in, and I was able to format my new 512GB drive. So lesson learned, don't try and use the unsupported Ethernet out of the box. However, on this computer, my screen recording was very janky, so you'll see some video footage that is captured of the monitor. I apologize, and also my Mac Pro 2019 with HDMI capture was temporarily offline, so this is what I have. This next part is going to get geeky, and I'll do my best to explain it in human speak. But I'm going to assume my audience is vaguely familiar with OpenCore, and if you aren't, I have a video explaining it, but in a single sentence, it's a bootloader for both Macs and Hackintoshes that acts as an intermediary to load macOS on unsupported hardware. OpenCore Legacy Patcher is a utility that does the dirty work of configuring OpenCore so old Intel Macs can run modern macOS. Stupidly or ignorantly, depending on your view, I figured that OpenCore Legacy Patcher would detect the hardware and automatically configure the drive for NVMe to be bootable on this computer. So of course immediately I tried to install macOS onto the NVMe. 
and it worked up until the point that it had to reboot. My Mac Pro 2008 couldn't see the NVMe drive. As previously stated, the Mac Pro 2008, unlike the 2009 and 2010, does not support native NVMe booting and OpenCore Legacy Patcher isn't that granular. To go back to another thing I said previously in this video, there are multiple vectors to get the Mac Pro 2008 to boot off NVMe. According to Mac Rumors, you have a total of four options, starting with a EFI shell with a startup.nsh script that sounds confusing, NVRAM hacks which sounds unreliable, and the most extreme, a boot ROM modification, which sounds really, really scary. Finally, we have the last option, which is really the second option, but I wanted to be a little more dramatic. Using a EFI bootloader, aka OpenCore. As previously mentioned, OpenCore Legacy Patcher is a configurator for OpenCore, so you don't have to mess with the OpenCore config.plist, but you can still hack your configuration afterward. OpenCore can sometimes be a bit like magic, except for instead of a wand, you have a keyboard, and instead of spells, you have a lot of Googling. On Mac Rumors, the directions are non-existent, but I have a secret weapon, overconfidence, despite never having configured OpenCore manually. The first step was to get the MVM Express DXE EFI. <laughs> that is weirdly difficult to say out loud. I found this on a GitHub in a Hackintosh underscore files repository. I had no idea if this was the correct file, but to save any suspense, it was. As far as I understand it, this is a Mac compatible EFI driver, so you can boot off NVMe SSDs. This does not apply to UEFI Macs because they have that baked in to the firmware. The next step is to mount the EFI partition, and this is getting into the woods, but any drive with a GUID partition scheme will have an EFI partition, or at least for the purpose of this discussion, it does. Part of the magic of Extensible Firmware Interface, or EFI, and later UEFI, U standing for Unified, is that you can easily load in firmware updates and applications without having to perform a full firmware update, or in the case of a PC, a BIOS update. We're mounting the EFI volume where all the EFI stuff lives, including OpenCore. On an Intel Mac, the EFI is the pre-boot loader, that thing you see if you hold down the Option key and the Apple logo. On a PC with UEFI, it'll look like BIOS. Since we can modify the EFI partition, it makes a bootloader like OpenCore possible. And if that sounds really confusing, EFI is like a primitive operating system that loads just enough so you can load a big boy operating system. You can mount this using the command line application DiskUtil. DiskUtil happens to be one of those rare Mac specific CLI apps that I can operate without having to look up the commands. The first step is to run DiskUtil list to see all the mounted drives. This can be tricky if you have a lot of drives connected to your computer to find the correct EFI to mount. Because I'm not smart, I forgot I have two different SATA drives in my computer that both have OpenCore installed on each one. So you'll want to confirm that you have the right EFI partition if you're on a computer with many drives. There's not really an easy way to do this other than a bit of guessing, and I'll come back to what I did wrong in a minute. Next, you'll need to use the sudo diskutil mount, and in my case, it's disk5s1. Disk5 is the fifth disk in the list, and s1 is the partition on the drive. You can see all the partitions in the list. With the drive now mounted, it's time to open up the EFI partition and look in the OC folder, then inside locate the folder named Drivers. Then you'll want to take the MVM Express DXE AEFI file and drag it into the drivers. That's still a mouthful. The next step is to open the config.plist file, and I highly recommend using a code editor like Visual Studio Code as it uses syntax highlighting, and doing this in text edit is a real pain. PLIST files are XML, which looks kind of like HTML because this is another markup language. And if you're a developer, mentioning XML might send shivers up your spine, but don't worry, PLIST use structured data representation. If you used OS X back in the early 2000s, you almost had to edit PLIST files occasionally by hand if you were a power user because OS X was pretty janky. PLIST files are preference files for OS X. For you kids out there, this is a similar experience of trying to daily drive OS 10.1 or 10.2. This is where I decided to completely wing it. I searched for other EFI files in the plist file and found where the drivers were being declared in the config. For people with some programming knowledge, you can probably guess where I'm going. We can see each driver is an array of DICT objects. Each DICT object has a key value pair, which can be a string or boolean, aka true or false. 
So what I did was copy another DICT entry and then paste it below another DICT object in the driver array. Next step was to configure it, so I changed the path string to NVMe Express DXE EFI, and being lazy, I just copy and pasted the file name from the finder. I also made sure load early was false. I did this by looking up on the internet and determined correctly that the NVMe driver wasn't as impactful to load right away. Then it was just a matter of saving the config file and rebooting, and I saw my incomplete install from earlier, which I could resume. At this point, my Mac Pro 2008 was booting off NVMe, something that Apple never intended. And of course, I was able to finish up installing Mac OS 12 again on my Mac Pro. To go back to what I did wrong the first time, I modified the wrong config plist because I mounted the wrong EFI partition with the old version of OpenCore. Most people will only have one OpenCore install on their computer, but since this computer is a project computer, my use case isn't normal, so I was a bit dismayed when it didn't work. But when I mounted my EFI partition a second time, I noticed the dates were from 2003, thus it couldn't be my new version of OpenCore. The final part was to get the 10 gigabit ethernet on the Mac Fiverr to work, and this is the same on any classic Mac Pro. Fortunately, there's an entire Mac Rumors thread on how to add a Quantia, I think I said that right, drivers to open core. We have Jazz NY, or is it Jazzy NY, and Martin Lowe to thank as they were able to find and provide the necessary Kex drivers to be injected into the boot process. The thread has the entire instructions, but I'll demonstrate it as it's pretty easy. From the foreign thread, download the kex files. There's two in total in a single zip. Then it's just a matter of copying these two files into the correct folder on the EFI partition which I had mounted with Diskutil, and then going into the OC folder and then the kex file folder. Kex files are kernel extensions for Mac OS, which are kind of like Windows drivers. OpenCore uses these to load or rather inject into Mac OS as it boots instead of modifying the OS. We have one last step. We need to add two DICT entries like we did before, but this time we need to add them into the kernel section, which is around line 300 something. Then we just need to copy and paste the text from the post, but the formatting will be off. This is not important, it's just easier to read. I created a GitHub gist with better formatting so you don't have to do this. Just hit save and reboot. Now if I go to my preferences, I can see that my network is from PCI Ethernet slot 1. In the system profiler, I again can see the network chipset listed as the Bonita AQC113. I connected to my Synology network attached storage to test my network speeds and I can copy a 12 gigabyte file in around 30 seconds. It hit a transfer speed of about 400 megabytes a second. The limiting factor is the NAS, not the 10 gig card. There's one last moonshot thing to try. I have two SSDs in this card. The second is my Windows 10 install from my Mac Pro 2019 and I want to see if this will work on this computer with open core. Well, it was worth a shot as I don't want to screw up my copy of Windows 10, but in theory, I should be able to put Windows on my Mac Pro 2008 with open core. All right, so I'm late into the editing process and I did something on my classic Mac Pro and that is update open core legacy patcher. And that caused my hacks to be obliterated. That's because it replaced my config. So if you happen to use a custom config file, you're gonna have to reapply your hacks or hold off updating open core legacy patcher for each version update. Just keep that in mind. Now for apples to oranges comparison on SSDs because we're comparing a SATA SSD to a PCIe SSD. In the amorphous disk mark tests, we can see that sequential reads and writes are roughly five times as fast as SATA. Without getting too deep into SSDs, what's interesting here is the SATA drive has DRAM and the NVMe drive does not. I'm comparing the upper mid-tier SATA drive to a budget NVMe drive. Using 8GB test means we're pushing past the DRAM or the SLC cache on either drive. Having proper DRAM means the SATA drive has an advantage in the random categories, but still is not as fast as the NVMe drive. It's also worth noting on the classic Mac Pros that they only have SATA 2, so we're not seeing the full SATA 3 speeds on the SATA SSD. Regardless, the limitation still exists, and you're definitely going to feel the speed of the NVMe. It's not going to be night and day, but it'll be significantly faster. I don't want to spend too much time talking about PCIe buses and the classic Mac Pros, as that's a whole topic inside itself. The classic Mac Pros from the 2008 to 2012 are PCI 2.0. Modern NVMe's are 3.0 and above. Hello, this is Editor Greg here. 
I'm going to move very fast here as I realize a lot of my audience already knows what I'm about to say. I've yet to mention that NVMe SSDs operate at 4x PCIe. On screen is a breakdown of the speeds based on PCIe generation. The Mac Pro 2008 through 2012 use PCIe 2.0. They have four slots, two of which are 4x and two of which are 16x. More x equals more lanes equals more bandwidth. Modern SSDs are PCI 3.0 and above, so they get pretty fast. However, if you plug in a 4x card into a 16x slot, you will not magically get more bandwidth. Oh right, I'm talking over myself. Let's go back to what I was saying. So you're leaving some maximum transfer speed on the table. Very certain PCIe M2 host cards can address more than the 4x lanes when stuck into the 16x slot and get the full performance. This card is not one of those. But the only cards that can do that are fairly expensive and specialized. So you're going to leave some performance on the table, just like if you're using an NVMe slot on a single PCIe slot in the classic Mac Pros in exchange for getting two NVMe drives and then the USB-C and the gigabit. And I assume that having that many different things on the single PCIe bus is why we're not seeing higher performance. Now for a brief review of the Mac Fiverr card. This is a killer single PCIe card for the classic Mac Pro user as it gives you everything you need Sans, of course, a GPU. This would have been the default classic Mac Pro upgrade had it come out a little sooner than mid-2022. At $299, it might seem a bit pricey until you add up all the individual upgrades together. The most expensive thing about this card is that it offers two NVMe slots as Apple does not support bifurcation, the splitting of PCIe lanes, in any of the Mac Pros, including the 2022. If you want to use multiple NVMe drives on a single PCIe slot, it requires a specialized chipset. These cards generally cost about $175 to $200 for two ports. Then there's the USB-C ports, which there are varying degrees of quality, which I demonstrated in one of my earliest YouTube videos about three or four years ago. This card is on the fast end, in line with ones that cost roughly $100. Lastly, for a Mac compatible 10 gigabit Ethernet card, it's about $100. I really like this card, and if you're a classic Mac Pro enthusiast, this is it. Pair this with something like a 6800 XT and you'll have the most absurd classic Mac Pro. The obvious problem is at $299, this is not a rational purchase for the classic Mac Pro as this computer is long past its sell-by date. That said, if you have a very specific need for a classic Mac Pro, then this becomes a pretty good buy as you're able to pack in all the most important upgrades into a single card and then still have two free PCIe slots for things like audio cards or more I.O. For modern Mac Pros like the 2019 or 2022, at $299 it's not a bad deal because you're getting two USB-C ports and two NVMe slots on a single card, but the 10 gigabit Ethernet port is completely unnecessary as modern Mac Pros have two 10 gigabit ports. Also, for being honest, most modern Mac Pro owners will never fill up all their PCIe slots, especially in that 2022. Besides, if you're really serious about NVMe storage such as myself, you have the Sonnet 4x4 Silent as four SSD slots on one card. If you want to know about that, I made a review about it, and it's fast. So in summary, the Mac Fiber is really good, but it's just very niche. Hey, I want to thank you in particular for making it to the end of this video. The YouTube metrics really appreciate that. And also I want to thank my Patreons for supporting me because it keeps me from putting mid-roll ads into this video. There's a list of all the people that make this possible. Thanks.